Uh, dear listener, and welcome to the Metacost Crypto Corner, brought to you by Navic. I'm your host, Nico, and today I'm joined by Faye Maidment and Charlie Cohen. And today um, we're talking about the thing that I'm excited about, which is digital expression in Web3. Um, and we also have two people on the pod that I'm also very excited to have on. Um, so we have Faye and Charlie. Um, yeah, let's kick this off. Quick intros and then we can dive straight in. Um, my name is Nico. I'm an investor on the crypto side at Bitcraft. And... Um, next to that, I also talk about blockchain and gaming, and that's what I'm doing today. Um, but I'm, I'm super excited to host uh, Faye and Charlie. So, uh, Faye, you want to, you know, kick this off with with an intro about yourself? Yes. Thank you so much, Nico. Really excited to be here. Um, so, hi everyone. I'm Faye. I'm an investor at Bitcraft. I've been here almost almost a year now, which is crazy. Um, I've got a strong interest in all things sort of digital fashion, virtual worlds, digital expression. Previously, I was a CMO at an avatar company um, before joining Venture. And then before that, actually worked momentarily in the fashion industry um, in a luxury I showroom know in that. Milan. It's new uh, so it's good to know. Did you yeah. not? Oh, sorry. <laughs> yes. Um, and uh, so imagine my excitement when we were in- introduced to Charlie. Um, it felt like the merging of two worlds. Uh, and we were able to lead the restless round, which we'll, we'll definitely cover in this uh, pod. Um, and that was joined by Rogue, um, VR Fund and Starting Line and angel investors, including Paris Hilton. Uh, so we're very excited to have her today um, to chat to her and, and hear her take on all things digital fashion and why Web3 is coming for the fashion industry. Uh, so we'll pause here and pass over to Charlie to uh, share a little bit more about her background. Thanks so much, Faye and Nico. Great to, great to be here. Um, so I started, I guess, what would now be described as a metaverse fashion brand 10 years ago. Um, so I've been in the space for a while, got into immersive tech, um, AR and VR pretty early on, looking at how to create virtual experiences around physical fashion. Um, from there, sort of segued into the gaming industry, started focusing more on virtual assets, um, so in-game skins that had physical fashion counterparts. Um, and as I became... Um, somewhat obsessed with tackling the interoperability issue uh, around uh, skins and in-game items. I fell down the NFT rabbit hole. Um, Obviously, I'm still there. Uh, Launched Restless from within that rabbit hole, uh, specifically to uh, tackle issues around interoperability, um, offering the ability to uh, customize wearables and have a real level of control over your virtual identity. No, amazing. And I think something that you didn't mention there that I think we have to start with is that you actually founded your own fashion brand at 15. So yes. I think we need to I think we need to start there also um, to tell us a little bit more about that journey, because to be quite honest with you, you don't really hear about that unless we're talking so, sort of more like the Roblox fashion groups, <laughs> which is definitely where, the, where they're starting early. But 15 for us and our gen is, is quite young. How did that happen? Um, so... I had just arrived in New Zealand uh, by boat from the UK. Um, so sort of two years sailing to New Zealand, I had quite a lot of time to um, think about what I wanted to do with my life um, upon arrival. Um, so I was drawing a lot, writing a lot, planning a lot. Um, and I'd always been very interested in fashion. Um, I think sort of inherited from my dad, who is quite a fashionista. Um, And by the time I got to New Zealand, um, we were in quite a remote um, area. Um, School was extremely easy compared to the UK. I was really bored. Um, And I decided that, okay, with all this spare time, it would be great to figure out what it actually means to run a fashion brand. I already had a bit of an inkling by then that design was probably a small part of it. Um, So I thought, okay, the best way to get my head around the rest of it is like... uh, supply chain, uh, wholesale, marketing, how to fill out a tax return, all that fun stuff. Um, It would be good to get the experience uh, then when there was just less pressure around it. Just one question. Why did you take a boat from the UK to New Zealand? (laughs) Oh, I would, I mean, why, why wouldn't you? I would highly recommend it to everyone. Like it was, it was an amazing formative experience um, from having a very adventurous mom and stepdad um so yeah it was uh it was their dream i was along for the ride um and yeah fantastic formative experience okay yeah school of life i love it exactly (laughs) um no that's that's awesome and sort of then taking 
fashion from like let's say the physical to the digital where did that all start i'm assuming that wasn't also on the boat um, that wasn't that wasn't also on the boat <laughs> Um, and and uh, just from my experience, also in the fashion industry, which was quite short, I'll I'll tell you, and you're you know far more advanced in that sense. Um, but obviously, right now it feels like yes, we've made great headway. But before, um, fashion was very much stuck in its traditional ways. And I'm curious as to why you felt like this was the route you wanted to take your career in fashion. I think because by the time, so I'd had this um, sort of experience of. Uh, running this brand before uni and then went into my fashion degree um during which time I was still um kind of experimenting with my um my own assorted businesses uh one of which was sort of accidentally falling into um social media marketing um my friends were mostly in um your sort of typical unpaid fashion internships um and just this kind of exposure Classic. to the traditional industry like just by the time I'd finished my degree I absolutely hated the fashion industry um so I was quite determined to do something that was different from what we've been seeing um so yeah, I'm sort of a firm believer like if you want to be able to change something you need to do it from the inside and it's really important for industries to have people and founders in them who are you know really uncomfortable with the, the current status quo otherwise nothing progresses um so one of the things that I was very interested in at that time and I hadn't sort of quite gone into the the actual virtual fashion side but um being able to create immersive virtual experiences that were an alternative to traditional fashion weeks um, and that was something that everybody could participate in um, and you know, be- get close to the brand, get to really understand the um, the inspirations behind the collection, um, a way for me to interact with the community and for them to interact with each other. Um, so that was my initial focus. Um, and then, as sort of through video games, I started to understand the potential for virtual fashion. Um, one piece that I was really excited about was. Uh, the like identity and self-expression piece because we spend you know arguably more time socializing interacting in digital than in physical um so our visual identity should you know have the same level of importance um you should have the same level of power over it in digital as you do in physical so that was very interesting to me and then the other piece was um sustainability so even though i'd set up charlie cohen as a sustainable brand um you know it's still not sustainable putting new product out into the world and that was something that i was very uncomfortable with so this idea of being able to shift a significant portion of the brand's revenue into pure digital uh was really appealing because you know i could uh, reduce Uh, like significantly Mm. reduce the amount of physical production I was doing and also even for pieces that we would physically produce I could um, test appetite take pre-orders via virtual fashion and then literally just produce to demand amazing and that just leads perfectly onto my next question which is how has that changed since the pandemic like there has been this rise of interest in virtual fashion Um, obviously we're not going to the bricks and mortar stores that was obviously then when we were all locked down um, and then we were sort of moving inward and playing our, our games, um, not really seeing anyone else. So as you mentioned, right, like the clothes that we're wearing were probably in PJs, but um, our, our characters look insane <laughs> because we're leveling up <laughs> uh, playing so much. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm super curious about about that. Yeah, the, I mean, the pandemic really accelerated things for us. Um, you know, we were in an amazing position of having, um, you know, we've now had experience at the beginning of 2020 in building virtual worlds and virtual retail environments um, and also creating purely digital fashion. Um, and at the same time, we also had um, a kind of small batch supply chain set up so we could still do some physical production, um, even with all of the restrictions. Um, Mm. so suddenly a lot of people wanted to collaborate with us because we had, uh, the solution to their, you know, their problem 
through 2020 um, and they had a whole marketing budget that needed redirecting. Um, so we did um, collaborations with, uh, with Reebok, with Assassin's Creed, with Sanrio. Um, I think, you know, there was the level of consumer understanding around virtual identity was already there because there was already like a prolific market for gaming skins but for wider industry outside of the gaming industry to really understand it um that you know that was a really significant shift um mm. during the pandemic yeah no super interesting and um danny loftus who you know you and i both know um member of red dow the the digital fashion dow she wrote this amazing white paper and she makes this like a really interesting distinction between like orl so on real life so digital fashion worn by humans and then url on real life so digital fashion worn by avatars um i'm curious like has this been this um innovation in the fashion space especially around digital fashion have brands been more excited by the orl or the url so avatars think, or humans i think orl was an easier proof of concept um mm. so we've seen a lot more um you know a lot more uh innovation around ar fashion versus avatar based fashion um sure. but i mean personally um i think that it's, you know, it's quite a limited market for um, ORL uh, besides, you know, as, as a sales tool for physical fashion, it makes sense. Um, I really like using AR to interact with physical garments rather than replace them. Um, so, you know, you can scan a marker on my garment and then it creates a digital layer um, to the garment rather than just being um, an AR dress. Um, I think it's it's more of a um, it's more of a fun additional experience rather than something that's really commercial. Um, whereas creating fashion for avatars is extremely commercial um, and very scalable. Mm, amazing. No, I, I completely agree. Um, and just thinking about how like the the Spark AR creators those lenses uh, as well, Lens Studio, like they're still not very easily monetized too. No, so it's, it's, it's a it's very really strange hard. concept to be selling yeah. selling an AR filter. And, you know, to be fair, mm. the for fashion especially, the, the tracking is still not there to have the type mm. of experience that you'd want to pay for. Yeah, and even that even brands might want to add on to their let's say the you IRL purchase or uh, yeah. yeah, ORL purchase, let's say. Um, super interesting, actually, this whole point. Obviously, I was working with avatars before, um, but it was more of a, an overlay. And we, you know, I definitely saw a lot of gaps there around sort of the monetization, but the creativity was was super strong. Um, so I'm, I'm really excited about what you're building at Restless and we'll get to that. Um, but wanted to sort of now sort of gradually think more about sort of your Web3 strategy so um, you sort of mentioned that you'd done a couple of collabs. Um, obviously, uh, actually, High Rise, one of uh, Bitcraft's portfolio companies, and then also fairly recently um, with established IP like uh, Pokemon, um, which was really exciting. Um, collaborating with Selfridges, obviously being Brits, that's just awesome. Um, that brand is, is stellar. Uh, can you share a little bit more of your learnings of these from these activations and how it? has informed your web three strategy with Resus? Yeah. So I think um, actually the collaboration we did with high rise was a very sort of key turning point for how I was thinking about this. So we, it was a collaboration with the Sanrio character, Gutama. Um, mm. And we had a physical collection. Um, we had a VR based experience in the museum of other realities with a VR based collection. Um, and then we also had the uh, collection within High Rise. Um, and it was the first time that we were really looking at this idea of um, interoperability, but it was a very convoluted experience for the actual uh, consumer because they had to have three different um, 
I guess, kind of purchase flows and experiences. Um, they weren't able to kind of go into one space and access everything from there. Um, so it was it was cool, but it still had this limitation. And from a licensing perspective, um, and you know, we mm. do most of what we're doing is around collaboration and licensing. It was a nightmare because we had to have sort of separate contracts and stipulations for each of these different um, activations and types of garment. Um, so that was really when I started kind of diving into like, how can we set it up so a customer can come into just one space um, and be able to, um, you know, access all of these different ways of um, like wearing and experiencing the collection um, one space where they can easily portal into these different worlds as well and then come back to where their kind of wardrobe is is living um, so mm. that that really was the um, ended up being the premise for Restless as through that I was trying to figure out how within the Charlie Cohen brand we could streamline um, and by the time I'd figured that out it just made much more sense to build it out as a completely separate product because it was addressing an issue that a lot of us are uh, like facing um in this industry no 100 percent. and and you also touched on something a little bit there around um ownership which i think is super important in web3 like we see it a lot on roblox that there are copycats now i mean the the creator um market is just so saturated now and those glasses i don't know whether you've seen them like the shades I think maybe I think up to like a hundred creators have have made them and are now selling them. And obviously, they're just outbidding each other on the starting price. And uh, obviously, the the original designer you you don't know of, right? The <laughs> it's 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 super interesting. And there was um, a great actually one of our venture partners, Seb, put me onto this great story of Anna Relu who runs Kestrel, um, the uh, the the fashion group on Roblox. And what had happened is when Gucci came onto the platform they realized that they'd actually copied some of their shading. And I'm just thinking with Web3, it would have been a maybe an easier route to sort of show that, you know, over time, show that ownership through the metadata. But here she had to go through the pixels and she had to do it side by side and she had to then share it to, with her lawyers. And it, it was super a super interesting one. And especially just with how fashion is going right now, I'm curious as to how you think about especially ownership and obviously copycats is just it's just common in the industry right yeah so like as as you touched on um i mean within virtual there are so many issues around copycats um also obviously historically <laughs> within physical um so yeah and you know nfts and blockchain they're you know proof of first um you can you know you can literally check the history you can also, um, you know, you can you can see who has owned stuff over time, um, which you know something that is quite common in the uh, physical fashion industry is that people will buy stuff and then copy it. If you have unlockables within digital that are backed by NFTs, you could literally track to see if somebody had done that. Um, so there, there are you know there are lots of ways that it's protecting IP. Um, the fact that you can build in royalties as well for like reuse and resale of what you've created um, is incredible because there's obviously no way to um, be able to benefit from a secondary market as an artist or a designer within the physical world um, or within um, sort of traditional gaming industry. Um, so that's another significant benefit as well. No, I love that. And also another point, because we're, you know, right now it feels like there's a new PFP project every day. Um, <laughs> and there with, is. <laughs> and and or, yeah, not just not just one either. So it's hard to keep track of all of those. But what I am seeing a lot of is or just hearing um, is that, you know, there's stories of those not fulfilling their roadmaps. So becoming really just a pure collectible over including, you know, any of the utility as promised. Now, the fun thing with digital fashion is that utility is just baked in at the core, right? Like it's, yes, you can collect, but you you don't necessarily wear fashion just to stare at it in your wardrobe. 
Um, sure. Well, I certainly don't anyway. Um, so, Or in your wallet. <laughs> or in the wallet. Yes, exactly. How odd is that? How odd is that? Such a strange I, I look behavior. at my wallet quite often. Just admire all my text-based NFTs, you know? You see, yeah, the thing is, if I was the owner of one of those D&G crowns, I mean, I would want to be wearing that everywhere. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, it's, it's so annoying to me that, that it's not... I'd, correct me if I'm wrong, Charlie, but I don't think you can wear those anywhere, right? No, I don't think you can. I think that... I feel like there is, like, a physical link to some of those D&G pieces. I think yes. now that you've said that, I really need to have a crown custom made for you so you can you can wear it everywhere and i will expect I to see it. you everywhere wearing it <laughs> <laughs> thank you no that would be really helpful but th- do you see what i'm saying though with, with digital fashion it's it's different and i think you know obviously we're just getting started really on this obviously pfps um it's it's also baked into the the character as a whole but um i think fashion on its own i think there's real utility baked in and I think that's what makes it so exciting also for Web3. Yeah, absolutely. I think, and also, you know, when it comes to PFPs, like their baked in utility is that you use it as your Twitter profile picture or your social media right. profile picture. And it's doing the same thing as fashion does. It's it's signaling something about your identity. Um, it's connecting you with a community who are buying into that same project. Um and with fashion, that's, you know, that's exactly what you're doing, just dressing your body. Um, and there are, you know, there are so many more applications within Web3 and the virtual world to use digital fashion as a way to express your identity. Um, but um, you could argue that like PFPs are fashion in their, in their yeah. own way because they are kind of doing that same thing. Yeah. If you're on YouTube, oh, super- I'm just showing off my fashion PFP. Look at this. Oh, oh God. gosh. So I have a PFP <laughs> NFT. Is it, is, it on the, is it on the press pocket? That's uh, that's not too bad. Yeah, I didn't know there was it's, it's uh, subtle, much. Right? Yeah. Very subtle, yeah. Put it on exactly specifically for it. this podcast. And sorry if you're listening to this. <laughs> we appreciate uh, uh, that. On the podcast uh, player. We do. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> we do. Um, and on that, actually, oh, Nico, perfect segue. So when you're thinking about working with crypto native brands so like the punks let's say as you've given us a great example here um versus sort of established legacy luxury or you know even streetwear brands is there a difference in your approach how how do you go like also around creativity around accessibility around the flexibility around the ip i'm sure that you're i mean i'm sure that both have a completely different perspective and maybe before we answer that could you like when you you say approach what what are you doing exactly i think maybe lay that as a foundation and then go into how you approach well how you do that exactly with different types of uh, of brands so i think um sort of streetwear and web3 native have the most similarities um mm-hmm. it's very much this you know based around building up this grassroots community that you launch into very much based around graphics and artwork um whereas luxury fashion the i mean that is the approach they need to be taking in web3 but the approach they've been taking traditionally is very top down so they're used to being able to pay for advertising pay for influences um and they're now experiencing in like with the web3 native customer that that doesn't fly um so the actual the actual approach i think should be very similar but it's much easier for a streetwear brand or a sportswear brand like like say adidas who did a pretty good job of coming into the space to get their head around because it's reflecting how they've approached things in the physical world or even in web2 based social media um luxury fashion i think it's even more important for them to be collaborating with um you know with artists who are already in the space because they have yet another set of steps they need to take to kind of prove that they're authentically thinking about how do they bring value to the community um they have a lot more to prove but they're coming from a place where they've been kind of able to sit on their laurels and they're used to people coming to them and they're used to having the power um, so it's, it's quite a head fuck for them. 
Oh, I'm sure. This is really interesting. And you mentioned Adidas. Like, could you share a little bit for those that may not have known about some of those drops? Yeah. So Adidas, like I honestly, like I'm throwing them out so much as an example that they should be paying me at this point. <laughs> um, Take but, note, yeah, Adidas. I'll be, <laughs> be sliding into the DMs asking where my royalty is. Um, but they, um, they took a whole year of um, engaging with community in the space before they even thought about, well, before they even spoke about monetizing and dropping a uh, product um, and that's something that I mean I have a lot of respect for I think the community at large has has a lot of respect for um, so they were very active and then when they did drop their first um, product they did it in collaboration with two really like well-loved well-respected IPs in the space um, Board Apes Yacht Club and Punk's Comics um, and also did it together with uh, G Money as a consultant, who is again like a very sort of well known and well respected collector in the space. So they had so many touch points along the way, just showing how much they'd thought about and researched what the community actually wants and what would, you know, how can they bring value to the space rather than how can the space bring value to them. No, that's really interesting. And I love that you brought up the power shift because I think it's really palpable um, right now. I love it. Brand- <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's never been this way. Right. So it's like it, it's super interesting just to view. And then just on the flip side, if we're moving away from brands and we're thinking more about platforms, um, specifically in the Web3 space, what do you think they should be considering when they're thinking about building out their avatar systems especially around expression. So, you know, thinking form factors, skins, et cetera. What are some of your must haves just from someone also building a platform within the space? So I guess from the avatar perspective, especially, um, we have a kind of clean slate here to address some of the issues that have been prolific in the physical fashion industry around like representation, body shape, skin color, like all of these things that have been, you know, a a major, major issue and, you know, still, you know, relatively little improvement um, in the last couple of decades. So I think there needs to be a real effort for platforms building out especially creating avatars first of all to make sure that within their actual teams they have um real representation um so that you know that can be fed back into how the actual products and avatars are being designed um and then yeah making sure that that then um informs how these avatars are created if you're um if you're creating something that is supposed to you know like if you're creating animals then fine um, but if you're creating something that is supposed to be reflecting kind of human race then I think there's a massive responsibility there to repair some of the damage that's been done yeah no amazing and and also in terms of interoperability do you think that there is some strength in having an avatar that can cross a, you know a few of these web3 worlds or do you think that being able to express yourself not doesn't just apply to dress but also different form factors like i'm just thinking to myself now i maybe i kind of like that i'm blocky in 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 roblox and then in fortnite i'm more streamlined and i you know it's it's obviously more high fidelity i'm i'm curious about whether you think that also it's just occurred to me not just around fashion but also the form factor I think it's nice to go on. Yeah, I was going to say, are you using Fortnite as an example for high fidelity? Yes. Why? I don't know. I I would probably. I know a few games who do a better job at high fidelity. But I'm I'm used to the blocky, so in a comparison, (laughs) it's relative to. (laughs) It's true. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. Fair point. Fair point. But yes. I'm curious about your thoughts around right, off, form off, off the back of that, off the back of that brutal burn. Yeah, um, I think <laughs> <laughs> I think it's good Classic. to have the the option. Um, so you know, I think you're gonna have sort of two 
sets of people um, with avatars and with fashion as well, like the ones who really do want to have a sort of very consistent identity um, across all of the platforms that they're engaging in. Um, and those who will want to explore different facets of their identity and different alter egos um, in each of these spaces. But it's certainly nice to be able to have like your avatar set up, especially when you just want to kind of investigate mm. an environment. So you can go in as you figure out, you know, the lay of the land there. Um, and then maybe that evolves into you creating your own like specific avatar that is uh, kind of fits more into the aesthetic of that space. Um, but, you know, interoperability should be just about having these options. Uh, however mm. you want to be exploring identity, you should be able to do that. Yeah, no, I think that's, I think that's totally fair. Um, and then I had one other question just around how you view NFTs and the idea of luxury and how, how luxury might be changing in the Web3 context. So luxury is is typically related to high quality, but in this sense, it's also with Web3, it's around ex- accessibility and exclusivity. And I'm curious about how you're thinking yeah. about building sort of a quote unquote luxury brand and what that means in this context. So, you know, in, in the NFT space, like luxury is, purely about scarcity yeah um and you know the the flex that's associated with scarcity like it means that you know if you got onto that first mint like you have to have been in the know maybe you're some you know maybe you got whitelisted because and you know that that is a flex um because this is such an exclusive uh, product so it doesn't necessarily even have to relate to price point in the same way um, but obviously, when you have something that's scarce, the likelihood is um, that the resale price is going to go up and up and up. Um, so that's that's really that's really how it's determined, I think, in the NFT space. Yeah, no, totally agree. Um, and then just sort of leading on from that, thinking more about accessibility. And it not be, and it being sorry, as you say, based on scarcity right now. I think that also comes from the lack of of three D design tools. Also, um, I'm I'm curious, like in digital fashion and three D asset creation, it feels like the the bottlenecks are around sort of the tools available. We've got Maya, we've got Blender. Obviously, on Roblox, it's a lot easier. But when you need to make something other than um, let's say t shirt and, and pant combo. Um, you really have to leave that to the the UGC experts, right? In the in the creator program. So I'm curious as to do you see a world in which everyone is able to create and customize their own virtual garments? What needs to change? Um, are you seeing any any cool um, innovations in this space? What gets you excited? Really curious on on that part. So I agree. Like right now, there is a huge barrier to three D three D design, and especially um 3d apparel where you're having to you're having to rig like there are so many different considerations um and just i guess like you know experience and technical know-how that's required um so mm. i think like yes it makes complete sense in the digital world that the actual consumer should be able to customize and personalize um and you know have a lot of you know power over the looks that they create for themselves um but we you know we need far more tools to support that like you say like you know roblox is a a good example of being you know you have your your building blocks exactly um, but being able to take some of those tools into something that's much more kind of high fidelity um that's you know that's a big challenge i guess you know that's why we're you know starting to tackle that with restless um so you know initially we're looking at around customizing with um, like graphics and texture application um and you know over time there will be more tools to be actually kind of playing around with the silhouettes mm-hmm. um and you know again like what we're doing there is making sure that once you've done that you're it's automatically creating a version for each of the worlds 
that you need it for. So you don't need to worry about building from scratch in each space. Um, Maybe we can dive but, double down on yeah. that and just sort of understand exactly yeah. how Restless works for a creator and also a consumer, both of those um, personas. I think that would be really helpful for uh, listeners also. Yeah, for sure. Um, so as so initially, I mean, initially we're starting off with these uh, curated drops, but as we start opening it up to user generated content, um, an artist is able to come in um, and drop their sort of limited edition graphics and textures to be applied to garments. Mm. Um, and then their fan base is able to come in, choose from a selection of silhouettes, um, customize it with these limited edition textures. So they could be, you know, they could be one of ones, they could be editions, um, just approaching it the same way as NFT art. Um, you mint that and then put together a bundle of different environments you want to be able to export it into. So for each of those environments, there's a version of that garment that's been created for that specific um, that specific engine or that specific aesthetic. Um, and as uh, Restless kind of continues to support more environments across um, I mean Web3, but also traditional gaming industry, you can continually come back in and add a version for that environment. Cool. No, that's really helpful. And then where brands come in is they allow their IP um, to be used as sort of the customized template, let's say, for creators. Exactly. Cool. Exactly. So what that enables is that brands have some level of control. Um, it's it's almost like it's the best of both worlds, right? They they allow the community to come in and experiment while also having the the management tooling to, you know, essentially still hold on and still get full visibility yeah, of, so of they where can, the IP is being used. They can build their own boundaries around exactly how the IP can be used. Um, you know, if there are commercial rights, in which case that user can, you know, create additions using that IP and um, and go on to sell those. Something that um, will work particularly well with uh, PFP projects, as so many of those have commercial rights. So it kind of allows a holder yeah. to monetize their pfp without having to sell it um oh super nice but uh, yeah from from the from the ip perspective um they have they have a lot of control they can um they can veto environments if there's a conflict especially when we're bringing in um gaming ip there's you know there's possibilities of conflict of you know competitor gamer environments um but uh yeah they and they're also able to um, so yeah, see how the IP is being used, um, collect all of the secondary market royalties and so on. No, amazing. And then my question on this part would be, which brand would you be most excited to work with? Which brand is on your wish list? Either to do a, um, an, an NFT drop collab or just to have them, um, you know, as a partner on Restless. So I think from the, like from the, PFP side, like it would be great to work with Yuga Labs, of course. Um, on the um, music side, and that's going to be a a real focus for us. Um, you know, really would love to work with artists who have you know already shown their commitment to Web three, like Grimes and Snoop. Yeah. Um, and then on the pop culture side, I think bringing in some of this um you know really iconic um anime ip like akira would be amazing oh no i i completely agree with you um and we're also very excited about that space we can't say too much right now but um yes we're also looking into it um quite intently uh and then sort of finally really want to talk to you a little bit about your decentraland activation and fashion week obviously the metaverse fashion week was big um spoke to a lot of people after who absolutely loved it and lots of brands came and, and obviously were representative there sorry represented there um so curious as to if whether you can share a little bit with listeners about what what you did in the space and uh some of the assets that you made i love them yeah <laughs> as you thank know thank you thank you <laughs> as yeah as as i know um so we um our decentraland experience was based around um a 
uh, a meteor, it's like a piece of the um, restless planet uh, that crashed into Decentraland. Um, so you could go into this kind of massive crystal um, and there, it was a kind of gamified experience where if you solve the, um, the mystery of the crystal, um, you'd, uh, you'd get a POAP. So we were um, we launched our Discord at the same time. So we had like a big meetup in there, and everyone was kind of working together to solve this riddle, which was really fun. Um, and then we had um, a rooftop after party as well, um, where we worked with uh, this awesome DJ, DJ Dave, who live codes uh, music. So we had um, we had her in avatar form, wearing the um, like Restless Times Charlie Cohen collection um which was kind of teasing a lot around the restless law so we had um we had these kind of very specific headphones that are part of the um like the restless avatar or the wrestling um that you'll be experiencing once you start kind of creating in the in the platform um we had uh, like crystal wings um and then um garments that were you know, uh, covered in kind of code and, and symbols. Um, so there's a, a big alchemy theme through how the Restless Law is being built out. Um, so we had lots of Easter eggs hidden in each of the designs and then in the space itself. I think it was just, it was really important for us to um, create something that wasn't just a kind of replica of what we could do as a like physical fashion show um, or a physical fashion installation, um, you know when you're, um, you know when you're like navigating around a digital space, you're not expecting as the consumer to have. You're not going in there just to look at stuff. You want to be able to do stuff um, and uh, you know engage with stuff and work things out. Um, so that's what we were kind of focusing very heavily on. No, oh, amazing. And um, our assets looked stunning and especially loved like the wings. Um, but uh, no, I know we had a little DM back and forth on that. Thought it was really great. And uh, finally, want to give you the um, opportunity now to just share a little bit more on what's next. Um, actually, for those that were listening very intently, uh, Charlie did give away the answer to the riddle on the discord so you may have to go back and listen again <laughs> um <laughs> but charlie tell us a little bit more of what's next um where they can find you what we can expect from restless um in the future yeah for sure um so we are ramping up to our launch um prior to that there will be a a month of beta um there'll be sort of further ciphers to access the beta um, and in there there will be a, a mint that is exclusive to the beta um, and then for public launch our first collaboration will be with a a much loved web3 native project um, that to yeah to kind of clue you in has a lot of has a lot of vibes famously a lot of vibes um, so that <laughs> <laughs> that's that's really exciting um and okay. we we have a, a pretty awesome lineup of um of projects web3 native artists um and sort of traditional ip especially music industry that's going to be coming through with these curated drops so it's really um you know uh, we're really focusing on pulling from both web3 native but also um traditional pop culture and music IP that really speaks to the Web3 um, Web audience. Um, so yeah, so that's that's kind of the, the lineup without giving too much away. Um, the best place for Alpha is our Discord. Um, we um, were also pretty active on Twitter at RestlessXYZ and you can get the, uh, the Discord invite link from there. Um, and I'm going to be fairly regularly doing AMAs on the Discord as well. So if you want to try and like hit me up for any more alpha and seeing why I let slip, then that's the place to do it. That's that's what we're here for, the alpha. Um, so 
one thing I like to do is to throw out things that I have in my head and then get a reaction from people that is usually like, what the hell are you talking about? Uh, and sometimes, oh, that makes sense. And so, you know, hearing you speak, should I think um, or should I imagine, you know, within five years, me wearing my restless X, you know, my, my favorite brand swag and using that within all of the, the virtual worlds that I like to hang out in? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> okay. Cool. Not not in five years, Already. like much sooner than that. <laughs> much sooner than that. All right. And and then as a next step, because I mean, okay, virtual worlds, that there it makes sense, right? Now I'm thinking, you know, multiplayer games, um, you know, like Fortnite. Do you think we'll be in, in a place where you'll be able to have your customizable characters within a game like that? Yes. Yeah. Um, we're already having those conversations and it's it's a different way of working. Um compared mm -hmm. to web3 native um and you know it will take longer obviously there is huge resistance from the um the gaming audience right now so mm -hmm. all of the triple mm -hmm. a's are pretty pretty scared um but one of the things that we're kind of focused on with restless is creating a a middle ground that allows um the traditional gaming industry to kind of dabble without having to be like, okay, we're creating an NFT. Um, so, so yeah, that's something that's a big focus for us. Mm -hmm. And one last question that I had when I, I heard you speak, I uh, heard you speak about brands. Um, whenever we've seen a major platform shift in the past, uh, whether it was in, you know, going from physical to, to, to digital or, um, you know, with the rise of mobile and free-to-play gaming within the gaming industry, more specific, we've often seen a very big shift in who the main players are. Um, and so my question is, how do you see the current uh, fashion, titans of fashion, exists um, within Web3? Do you think they have the correct mindset to... Um, fully partake in this um, or do you think we'll see you know more web3 native brands actually like become you know the new uh, Louis Vuitton etc I think some of the traditional brands they get it very you know a very small minority of them um, but I think now is an amazing opportunity um, for there to be um, you know new new legacies beginning in web3 um, I think you know we've it's been sort of long enough um, working with the sort of hierarchies and old guard of the traditional fashion industry. Um, so personally, I would love to see, um, you know, Web3 Native kind of taking over and really taking the power that they have right now. Um, I think in reality, we'll see kind of a combination of, you know, some, some traditional brands who really get their head around it, but also um, new brands emerging from the Web3 space. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. Cool. Well, um, this was extremely enlightening. I, I learned a lot. This is a space that I, I don't think about enough because um, I'm in my PJs at home and, you know, my avatars in virtual worlds, they wear, you know, magic clothes because I'm a mage in Elden Ring. So I don't, I, that, that's all I do. Yeah. I, I like to suffer. Uh, anyway, so this, this was amazing. Um, Charlie and Faye, uh, thank you so much for being here. Both of you are great. I'm very jealous of that Oh, very clear British accent. Um, yeah, it's just it's just amazing. I love listening to this. Good, good. Like, yeah, I might put this on. I, I didn't say too much, so I might put this on. You know, just calm down before I go to bed. Amazing. A bit of ASMR. Cool. Well, listener. Yeah, yeah <laughs> there Especially you go. With this mic. Um, listener. Yeah, yeah. I, I forced Faye to get a mic, and um, I'm I'm trying to get him, her on more. So if I should really push, let me know, and then I, I might have some some. You know, I can tell the listeners want this. Do it for the listeners. Anyway, if you made it till here, thank you so much. Uh, we really hope you enjoyed. And if you can, smash that like button. I love saying that. And, you know, Spotify also allows you to rate your podcast. So give us five stars if you think we did a good job, um, especially Faye and Charlie. Um, and yeah, with that, uh, Faye, Charlie, thank you so much. Listener, thank you for listening. This was The Metacost by Navic, and we look forward to speaking to you in the next episode. Cheers. Cheers.